So if you ever do ask that police officer what the Eighth Amendment is, you probably should know what it is yourself. It's um, um, excessive bail should not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. So no excessive bail. You cannot have excessive bail. You can't have excessive fines, uh, nor cruel and unusual punishment. That's the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution. Um, that's just one of our many freedoms. I was challenging the police officers of Kentucky to know the Ten Amendments to the Constitution. Do you know the Bill of Rights? And do you know the 26 sections of Kentucky's Constitution? The 26 sections of the Bill of Rights for Kentucky people? Do you know those? Um, one of them is you can't throw people into prison for debt. So if they are indebted to somebody, owe a bunch of money, you can't put them in prison. There is no debtor's prison in Kentucky, that's guaranteed by the Kentucky Constitution. Um, there's a, a whole bunch of stuff, right? 2015, we passed uh, 67 new laws Kentucky has. And there's lots of things that we've done. We've done so many different things. Um, one thing that we've done, I mean, there's... Um, there's... <laughs> Uh, there's uh, amendment riders good law, right? So if we pass a bill, we'll also have like two or three amendments or some laws that we have uh, more amendment riders than what the law actually is. Uh, there's there's one bill that actually says that it has uh, one, you know, um, one law, but then it'll have like three amendment riders that are actually more important than the, what the law is. Uh, we also have contradictions. We make uh, gambling even more illegal. And then we um, also, uh, unless it's a bingo hall, unless it's a church, and if it's a church hall, then you're allowed to actually have kids. Kids can come in and gamble as long as they're with an adult. It doesn't even have to be their parent. Just some adult can bring a kid into a church hall, and then they can gamble and play bingo. Uh, but they're not allowed to uh, uh, gamble online at a business. So uh, internet gaming is illegal if you do it at a business. You can't win for cash prizes. You have to, you know, basically just do Kentucky's gaming, uh, Kentucky lottery, and, you know, Kentucky capitalism. That's the only type of gambling in the horse parks um, that you're allowed in casinos. When they bring casinos in, it'll just be their casinos. You're not allowed to actually, you know, um, internet gaming. We were supposed to, uh, Steve Brashear was mandated on, you know, got elected eight years ago to bring gambling to Kentucky. It never happened. In fact, we're regressing because they just made gambling even more illegal. So if you go home and you bet on some game, you're allowed to, you know, make money in the privacy of your own home. But if you go out to, you know, whatever place, it doesn't even matter, but any retail shop, and you play an internet online game, they cannot actually give you cash money prizes. Even if there was like some sort of, you know, even if it was your money to, 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 to take. So there's contradictions. Um, there's a whole bunch of riders. There, there's comprehensive bills. They just completely gut out entire sections. They repeal. So many KRS statutes have been repealed. So many brand new laws are being written. So... Uh, there's a whole, whole slew of things that I want to talk about. First, I'm going to mention, this, again, the student super bill. I am stuck on this, okay? So the amendment writers did make it more difficult to get it passed, but well, the transgender discrimination writer was a bad one, but the political and religious freedom writer, I don't have a problem with. The ACLU pointed out some issues that we might have, and you know, the more I read about it, it's not 100%, but it's not a bad thing. Uh, why are we against our students having political and religious freedom? Political and religious. That would mean that if you're a Christian, you know, your rights would be protected. But it also protects your rights if you're a Muslim or an atheist or a Republican or a Democrat. It's, rep it's political and religious freedom. And since, you know, there's no freedom, there's no democracy, it's 100% compliance in our schools right now. Uh, the public education doesn't teach civics. It doesn't have any democratic institutions. It's all just uh, sit and get, shut up, sit down, do what you're told. You know, there's no um, actual democracy. There's no democratic forms, no voting, no uh, where the students actually get to participate in their own uh, uh, creating of their own curriculum and, you know, uh, making their own decisions about what they want to study and where they want to go in life. And, uh, you know, we make them docile and obedient for 18 years and then kick them out and say, hey, go fly. Well, how are we going to fly? We've been sitting in our chairs the entire time. How are we going to fly? Yeah, maybe we should have been flying. Maybe you should have been teaching us to fly for the 13 years that you had us stuck in here. Sitting here stuck in a chair, listening to you go on and on about whatever the hell you think you know. You don't know jack shit. 
You know, I, I would have learned more if I would have talked to my friends and uh, looked at the internet and came up with new stuff. Go to the courthouse. You learn way more if you would have sat at the courthouse as many hours as you sat in school. That's the center of power for the county. That's where the courthouse click. That's where the pocket tyrannies uh, that interpret the Constitution and all these laws in any way that they feel like it. Usually the county attorney. The county attorney is the one that heads the ship and then everybody else kind of goes along with it. And then it's all it is obedience, right? Well, he's the county attorney. We just do what he says. But then sometimes the tail wags the dog, right? Sometimes the police officer does something. The county attorney has to defend the police officer. I know Spike Wright out of Gallatin County says his job is to defend the police. So wait a second. Is he the one that's telling us what the laws are and how we're supposed to govern? Or do the police do it? And then he covers him up. And so the police are just rogue individuals going around, you know, doing creating whatever havoc they want to create. And the county attorney just blindly backs them no matter what assault or what criminality they put upon others i think we're you know um so there's this the student super bill uh hb 236 they they make it sound like it was the republicans who killed it because they added these amendment riders and it's it's so they wanted to have a say so in these uh superintendent screening committees so they wanted to have a say so they want to have a student seat um, at the table, and um, the Senate says, yeah, we'll let you have someone at the table. They don't have a right to vote, and we also want you to pass an amendment writer that says that all students have the right to any religious or political speech that they want to say. And um, and so I read a little bit about the bill because, or about the articles about this bill, because that's that's a good idea. Why why would we be against freedom? I I know why we're against freedom. In um, Tinker v. Des Moines, a big Supreme Court case, you had a student wear an armband uh, to show his opposition to the Vietnam War. That's all he had. That's all he had was an armband, and uh, that that went to the Supreme Court because they said it was disrupting learning. Him having a protest against the war, a silent protest, wasn't disrupting, wouldn't say anything, wasn't blocking commerce or stopping anybody from thinking. <coughs> Just had an armband. That's it. That's it. And there was like, oh, I don't know. Do, are students allowed to wear armbands that convey? A message about some important political issue. We don't know. They are young Americans, and uh, when they're adults, they have free speech. But when we trap them into public schools, do they have the right to speak? We don't know. And, and it took all the way to the Supreme Court to eventually say yes, yes. The uh, right of an, being an American doesn't stop at the school uh, house door. Basically, it says that children don't have adult rights, but they have children's rights, and they have, you know, young adult rights and students' rights. So they have some rights, and in fact, we should be practicing our democratic institutions if we expect those type of institutions to um, to thrive and to to be maintained. Every generation must win its own freedom. What freedoms do does our generation want? Do we want any freedoms? The Patriot Act and the War Powers Act. I mean, my God. The, the the no search, unreasonable search and seizures, Patriot Act, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment. It almost seems like there. What what rights do we have anymore? It's a police state. If they was to sit there and just the, there's uh, people in Chicago was being thrown in a secret prison. So cops were nabbing people off the streets, put them in secret prisons, not charging them with anything, and just keeping them locked up for days. And then eventually they're released. What are they going to say? Hey, this thing happened. Who's going to believe them? And they have to have evidence and. So to, to think that those in authority could disappear somebody, that's not, um, that's actually, that's, you know, uh, that the, the, the big Beverly Hills fire. That was the mob who burned it down and the government officials who covered it up. It was government officials who raped Charlie Manson, the, uh, the juvenile uh, jailer rapist. So those people who was, you know, running the reformatory schools for boys were raping the boys. So, I mean, it's not that big a deal, or it's not that big a surprise to think that uh, those in a position of power can become corrupted by that power. In fact, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Every person has the capacity of being evil and being good. And giving someone power and then not holding them accountable, that almost seems like a perfect recipe for them to be corrupt. I would err on the side of pretty much everybody's probably corrupt unless, you know, you prove to me that you're not. Um, to, to assume that just because, well, you know, that that is the county attorney. He just must be good. 
That's just ridiculous. That's just so stupid. Just by virtue of the office, it's just a good person. It, it matters about the person and their own character. It has very little to do... The office actually would invite um, corruption into it. And Kentucky is number one for illegal and legal corruption. That's a Harvard study that was done last year. Okay, so this uh, student super bill. So you got House Bill 236. Um, it's, uh, you know, just this tiny little bill that the Henry County High School uh, students wanted to work on and do. Uh, they want to have uh, Fayette County and Bowling Green right now has no superintendent. So they have to have a superintendent screening committee, which is composed of teachers and parents and administrators and people in the community, including one minority member. It must be one minority person. If there's no minority, then they have to get a minority. So it's either six or seven. Six of, you know, all the required people, but if none of them are the minority, then you have to, you know, throw in a token minority person. So six, maybe seven people are on this council uh, to pick the superintendent, but no students. So the students have no say, so they have no say, so in school they have no say, so whatsoever. In Owen County, uh, Kentucky, they have a student representative that's on the school board. And I think it's a non-voting member, but at least they have a, a seat at the table. You know, if you're sitting at the table, even if they screw you over, at least they got to do it to your face. they got to say, well, we're going to go ahead and just, uh, you know, um, make all the kids wear uniforms and just, you know, who cares about their individual creativity. Or the opposite. I don't know what stu whatever students want is what they want, right? Uh, but they would have to impose that in front of a student. Uh, it's only one student, and I'm sure they could easily be swayed to be a sycophant. You know, that's uh, pretty much your straight A students are your biggest sycophants, anyways. So, um, and, the, and the students should run the schools. In fact, very many, uh, the authority figures stop learning from actually happening instead of allowing, you know, uh, their curiosity to govern what it is that they learn and allowing their social sort of, um, their, their biology to be sociable and to figure out problems and to want to interact with others. Uh, to, uh, you know, um, Sugata Mitra says that education is self-organizing and self-emergent. So you just need to get the authority figures to move back, give them the tools that they need, make sure they're not fighting and, you know, hurting each other. And if they're doing good and learning stuff, then that's, that's the direction we need to go to. So, um, of course, there is no freedom in schools. Everybody's going to school. Right, it's we're just another brick in the wall. Shut up, little Jimmy. You know, um, get in the corner and let's all just laugh at him. Uh, no solidarity. The students are not allowed to even talk to each other. You you'll be you know um, uh, chastised and yelled at if you pass a note. Hey, how dare you pass a note to one of your friends? And um, and so of course it's a totalitarian fascist environment. Um, it's not democratic, and so I think it's. I, it wasn't a shock or a surprise to me to think that Frankfurt would kill a bill that students themselves had designed in order to give them a little bit of more power, um, a, a little bit, a teeny tiny bit more power. And it was not even power; it's influence because the superintendent has all the power, and they just wanted to have a little bit of influence in the decision to pick that superintendent. So that's not power, that's just a little bit of influence to determine who might actually get the power. But instead, the students have no say-so whatsoever. Not a big shock, not a big shock at all. And um, that's why I'm, I'm kind of disheartened a little bit why they wouldn't go along with this amendment rider. Uh, the amendment rider the ACLU is against, and I'm very much in favor of the ACLU and freedom of speech. But the bill itself is... Uh, the the student expression bill that was the original title of the bill that they attached as an amendment writer was the student expression and so when you think about the student expression bill students should have a right to actually be able to express themselves so let's uh, actually read a little bit of the text that comes from it's Senate Bill 71 and um, it's an act Let's see, it's sponsored by Robinson, Alvarado, Carol Embry, uh, Girdler, and Wilson. An act relating to voluntary student expression of religious or political viewpoints in public schools. So far, I don't have a problem with any of this. Amendment, uh, amend KRS 158183 to permit students to voluntarily express religious or political viewpoints in school assignments free from discrimination and to require local boards of education to ensure 
that the selection of student speakers is made in a viewpoint neutral manner and that the students prepared remarks are not reviewed, altered or censored before delivery. When I was about to make my valedictorian speech at Gallatin County High School, you had Raymond Spawn and you had uh, um, the, uh, the the counselor. It wasn't Miss Eaters. It was the next person after Miss Eaters. Mm, I don't know. She was a really crappy person. She threw away my scholarship to UK, right? Uh, but they they weren't going to they weren't going to allow me to say the remarks that I wanted to actually say. And I wasn't going to say anything bad or mean. I was just going to kind of, um, you know, uh, characterize and uh, um, sort of imitate my, you know, um, my my teachers that I liked and appreciated. And it would have been a, you know, imitation is the best, you know, the greatest form of flattery. It wouldn't have been like a mean impression. Anyways, it doesn't matter. The point is, I was valedictorian. I had a right to say what I want to say, but I never got that chance. I never got to say what I actually want to tell my, you know, graduating class, my community, when I had earned, you know, four years of straight A's of having no life whatsoever, um, not going to senior skip day, you know, doing every extra credit thing, trying to, you know, just doing anything and everything uh, for four years, and I wasn't allowed to say what I wanted to say in my, you know, five minutes of speaking time. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. So the one time that I got a chance to say what I want to say, I wasn't allowed to do it. So how did they prepare me, you know, Kentucky schools, Kentucky public schools, how did they prepare me for life? They didn't prepare me to say whatever it is that I want to say and to lead by what I believed in. They, you know, censored me and they made me say a bunch of, you know, irrelevant bullshit that, uh, you know, I, I said out loud. But in, um, I actually I got a lot of, um, uh, you know, people said people said it was a good speech and that they enjoyed hearing about it. But it... Um, it wasn't what I actually wanted to say. And I was valedictorian. So this is, you know, this is incredible. This could be for every paper that a person writes, any type of demonstration a person writes. You cannot alter it. You say this is the topic that they want to speak about. They get in front of the room. They speak about it. That's what, you know, that's what they have a right to do that. And, um, and, and to disagree with somebody, disagree with their religion, disagree with their politics, but if they have a reason behind for, you know, the, the things that they believe, then that's, that's democracy. We are, we tolerate different viewpoints, and if you're able to articulate a, a, a position and have reasoning behind the, the things that you believe, you, you know, you can't, you can argue with it, but they, in their mind, they believe and they have reasons for what they believe. So you can't, you know, you can't attack somebody. You can't discriminate against somebody because they have their own independent thoughts. And really, many times, having your own independent thoughts is like the biggest crime in the world. So this is... Let's just keep on reading. So it says, um, in a neutral, um, uh, a neutral manner, a viewpoint neutral manner, um, school assignments free from discriminations. It says the remarks aren't reviewed, altered, or censored before delivery. Religious and political organizations are allowed equal access to public forums on the same basis as non-religious and non-political organizations. That's even more incredible. There is, you know, the schools are in the middle of the community. And so if there's a non-political, which is no such thing as a non-political entity, but let's just assume that there is, you know, um, some organization that's able to get in there. They're not political uh, for, you know, I don't know, some some forum, some type of, I don't know, debate or something. I don't know. It doesn't matter. Everybody should have equal access, you know, and your politics and your religion should not be a tax. If it's an open forum for anybody to come into it and you say, well, you know, every Everybody can come here but the Jews. We don't want the Jews here and we don't want to hear their Jew talk and, you know, let's censor their Jew remarks. And um, let's have no Jew type talk, right? No no Yiddish. If they ban Yiddish, right, then that would be um, clearly that's discriminating against another religion. The Jewish people should be allowed to say what they want to say if, the, you know, the forum is about religion or about whatever it is the forum is about. Um no recognized religious or political student organization is discriminated against in the ordering of its internal affairs. Even better, right? Students make their own clubs and they're allowed to run their own clubs how they want to. Create a new section of KRS Chapter 164 to require public post-secondary education institution governing boards to ensure that students are permitted to voluntarily express religious or political viewpoints in assignments free from discrimination. That the selection of student speakers is made in a mutual a viewpoint neutral manner and that the students prepared remarks are not reviewed, altered, or censured before delivery. That religious and political organizations are allowed equal access 
to public forums on the same basis as non-religious and non-political organizations that no recognized religious or political student organization is discriminated against in the ordering of its internal affairs. So repeating itself, but it's good stuff. Um, so I'll finish that. There shall be no restrictions on speech that occurs outdoors on campus and is protected by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, except for restrictions that are reasonable, justified without reference to speech content, narrowly tailored to serve government interests and limited to provide alternative options for the communication of the information. I don't know what's wrong with it. It even says, add preamble to clarify purpose of enforcing constitutional rights secured by both constitutions of the United States and Kentucky. Allow students prepared remarks to be reviewed prior to delivery at the student's request. So if the student wants, why, why do you even have to add that part into it? If they want it to be read and, and uh, edited, then that is up to them. Um, but that's so, you know, some overbearing principle could force a student well, uh, do you allow me to read it? All right, fine. I don't know. It doesn't matter. But the uh, the point is still freedom of speech. It protects all religions. It protects all political viewpoints. Somebody says that it doesn't expand freedoms, and the people's like, well, what are we doing here? It's to clarify and say that, you know, this is a great bill. This is a great bill because we don't have freedom. There is no freedom of speech, uh, freedom of religion, freedom of political viewpoints in schools whatsoever because there's no democracy. It's 100% compliance, 0% freedom, 0% democracy. They don't teach civics. They don't empower the students because the uh, students are supposed to be dumb, docile, ignorant sheep to just, you know, blindly follow orders for the rest of their lives. And they're going to be manipulated for the rest of their lives if um, we continue to the, the, allow the, the public education system to teach the way that they are being uh, have been teaching. So the, there's nothing wrong with this amendment writer. The, um, the ACLU, which I respect, did come up with an exception to this. And what they had said... Um, was that the ACLU released a statement condemning the bill, claiming it would not only result in unnecessary litigation, but would prohibit Kentucky's local boards of education and public universities from denying funding to student organizations that discriminate against members based on sexual orientation or religion. So if you use religion to discriminate against homosexuals, if you use religion to, you know, to be sort of a dick, I mean, hate speech... You're not allowed to have a hate crime, but hate speech is speech. You can't threaten anybody. I don't know. Um, they're basically saying that it would prohibit that if you say, I don't want to fund this organization because it, you know, it preaches bigotry. Then it's saying, well, you're not allowed to do that because, you know, this law says it's not allowed to do it. I, while I see that as pro possibly being a problem... And I would also agree that it's probably uh, Christian fundamentalists who are pushing this because both of them reference the Bell County um, uh, article where it says they end the tradition of prayer before football games. This is written in 2011. So Bell County isn't allowed to say prayers. They always want to say prayers. Some people had a problem with it. Now they're not allowed to say prayers. Everybody's up in arms and they're all pissed about it. Um <coughs> I mean, I kind of see the point. That it's separation of church and state. So if I'm an atheist or if I'm a Muslim and you're sitting there having a prayer with the football team, why do I have to sit there and tolerate, you know, you're sort of, if I'm a Muslim, let's flip it around. I'm a Muslim coach and I'm saying, you know, all graces to Allah and I say a prayer and I hold the Quran and I say, let's do this for Allah. And you all sit there and just have to be forced to listen to me sit there go on and on about how great the Islamic religion is. If you're a Christian, you would feel compelled that you would have to either be silent and go along with it. Or, you know, if everybody's going along with this and nobody's saying anything about it, it would put a lot of undue pressure for you to not really protest against it, not really say much about it. Just let it happen and just to keep on, you know, go, go about your life. Um... So, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't mind. There's no big deal. Right now, the law, the ACLU is pointing out that the law says that you're allowed to have religious practices as long as it's not obstructing 
anything. So if you say a little prayer before a meal, not a big deal. Separation of church and state doesn't mean no religion whatsoever. It just means you got to be fair about it. So if you have the Ten Commandments, you also got to have the Islamic Commandments. And some people say, well, that's the way we want it. We want to put God and Ten Commandments back in the school. All right, that's fine. But you're going to put all other 3,000 gods and Bibles and, you know, um, Qurans and holy books right along with them. Because it's either you're, you're fair for everybody or you're fair for nobody. You, you either teach every single religion or you teach no religion. So you want the Ten Commandments and God in school? All right, that's okay. So let's get Allah in school. Let's get Buddhist in school. Let's get even devil worshipers, right? So the people, I don't know if it was Oklahoma, but there are some people that says, hey, we want, you know, I don't know, a, a, a statue of Jesus. It's Judeo-Christian value country, blah, blah, blah. Let's get a statue of Jesus at the Capitol. And it's like, all right, we'll do this, but we have to allow anybody else that wants to put up their statue uh, is allowed to do that. Are you sure you want to do that? Yes, Jesus is our God. Let's put, so they put a statue of Jesus up, and then they put a statue of uh, Satan, like a goat, a goat Satan who's got a hold in some weird coat, and he's got like a little child in his um, lap, very gentle, very nice, uh, but it's Satan. So, is that what you wanted? You wanted to have a statue of Jesus and a statue of Satan? Is that what you were calling for? Because if you are fair to one religion, you got to be fair to all religions. So, you want to sit there and allow Satanists to say their prayers, you know, um, in a, a football game? No, I think that's that would be wrong. That would be wrong to for a coach to force their players to listen to his satanic, you know, prayers and speeches and whatever type of Latin or whatever. I don't know anything about what Satanists do, but, you know, if you're a Christian, I would think that that would outrage you. You would not want your coach, you know, making uh, satanic prayers right before the big game. And, um, and so that's what, you know, that's, I think, is the dividing line. It's sort of, it's all, we're all going to talk about all these things, or we're going to talk about none of these things. And I think the separation of church and state has kept it to where we actually don't talk about any of this stuff. But maybe a conversation is warranted. Maybe let's have the satanic prayers. You know, if that's what you say, you want God in school and you want the Ten Commandments in school, well, that means all religions are going to go to school. We're going to put the Greek gods, the Roman gods, Hercules, uh, Apollo, you know, Zoroaster, we're going to put all the gods in the entire world uh, to be talked about and displayed. Not just one religion, because you cannot endorse a single religion. You cannot say this school is for Christianity. You're not allowed to do that. You say that, then that means you're going to have a school that's for um, Islamic people. You're going to have a school that's for Satanic people. You're going to have a school for atheists. You're going to have all these different schools, and we're a public school. So we got to be inclusive of everybody. So since we can't back one religion, you either back all the study of all the religions, all the politics, all the political viewpoints, which is what this bill was uh, saying on the surface of it, um, and, um, and, or none of it. You say, we don't want any of it, let's just keep it separate, keep it out of it. And, uh, you know, Muslims can say their prayer before their meals. Christians can say their prayers before meals. But there's no reason to shove our religion down people's throats that don't want to hear it. And um, so I see the ACLU's point. I see what they're going for. But I like the bill. And I think that there's no freedom in schools that I would have, uh, if I was Greg Stumbo, I would have signed House Bill 236. I would have signed it um, with the amendment writer of uh, Robinson's. Uh, with his, um, you know, political and religious freedom. If uh, Robinson had passed his law and I had got to say my valedictorian speech, I'd be allowed to say it without any restrictions, without anybody censoring me. And, you know, straight A's, I would think I earned it. I would actually think if you wanted someone to be a leader, you would have them making speeches all the time, and then it wouldn't be just one final speech, one last hurrah. You know, it would have been a culmination of many speeches, and then, you know, that's how you teach leadership, is you've been teaching leadership for 13 years. And then the one opportunity where the person gets a leadership, you know, speaking engagement, you're going to take it away from them? Like, my God, that's there's already enough pressure on you as it is. You haven't had any practice, and now you got to be a leader, and now they're saying, hey, you're not allowed to say what you want to say. Well, I'm not allowed to say what I want to say, then what am I allowed to say? Whatever you tell me, hell, why don't you just write the damn speech and I'll just go ahead and repeat whatever, you know, crap comes out of your, um, out of your head. 
So, um, you know, I, I think uh, schools are backwards. I think we, uh, schools should be for liberation, but instead they're for oppression. And so I would have been in favor of, of course, allowing the student to be on the superintendent screening committee. Of course, they should be allowed to do that. Um, but I would have also assigned this amendment writer along with the bill. So that way, that would have made the Henry Clay high school students happy. And it would have made Robinson and anybody who believes in freedom of speech, political or religious or otherwise, happy too. It reinforces the statutes that are on the books. And, um, and so when that Bell County case happens, you know, um, I think you have to inform the entire public of what's going on. When that coach in Bell County starts saying a prayer and somebody, you know, little, little Sally, the cheerleader wants to go off and, you know, do some satanic ritual. You got to let her do it because that's her religion and you protect religion. So are you being serious about freedom or not? Freedom is wild and it's crazy, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Topics.com shows us what freedom looks like, and it's ugly and it's disgusting, but frankly, I wouldn't want to have it any other way. It's the Wild West, and most people know that 80, 90% of Topics is, is bullshit. It's a bunch of lies. But that's, uh, that's, that, that's Kentuckians who's typing all those words. So um, that also shows there's weird, um, there's a bunch of weird people out there who's very frustrated. And um, it also shows that this is this is how people think. This is what people would rather do is express, you know, their viewpoints on gossip and a bunch of bullshit instead of talking about politics or solidarity or the truth or justice or, you know, um, honor and dignity. You know, there's a, there's a serious gap between um, the people and the elite of Kentucky. So I would be 100% in favor of House Bill 236. Uh, uh, which was failed, the Stumbo uh, failed to pass it um, after the amendment writers. Uh, C.B. Embry took the transgender discrimination bill off of it. So that was not that was not even a reason to, you know, the Greg Stumbo couldn't argue against that part. He would have had to have argued against um, this uh, political and religious freedom bill. And I think that's, um, that's what they did. So, I haven't got to the heroin bill yet. But next video coming up, it's all about heroin. Heroin is, is uh, the heroin law is, is uh, been put into effect today. It was an emergency, so or three days ago. So when Brashear signed it, immediately, if you had a gram, if you have two grams of um, cocaine, then you're a trafficker and they'll, they'll lock you up for a class D felony. And nickel is five grams, okay? So this is five grams. If you have two grams, so just imagine two fists of this nickel. If you have two fists of this nickel worth of heroin, you're a class D felon. And you could be looking at five to ten years in prison. And they'll try to make you look like a trafficker. They'll put a bunch of enhancement charges on you. Um, you know, paraphernalia charge, scales, money. They'll steal all your money, right? They'll assume all, all of it must have been drug money, right? Every single dime of it, even if you had worked hard for it and just uh, bought yourself, you know, uh, two grams of heroin for your, uh, you know, your, your at the end of the evening um, day drink of alcohol, right? I, I'm not judging. Heroin ain't my thing, but we should have a right to our own bodies. The war on drugs has been a miserable failure. And um, to make somebody, to throw somebody in prison, somebody in prison for having that tiny bit of amount of heroin, and uh, it's a manufactured crisis. Every one of these crises, the meth crisis, all the, the crime and everything else, the Oxycontin, oh my God, the crime and everybody dying. And then, you know, the every bit of it, it seems like every year there's it's a cycle. And uh, this this entire thing came from the Oxycontin. They, cr they crunched down on Oxycontin, and that's hillbilly heroin. So now you couldn't go and get an $80 pill, you know, from your doctor who was prescribing it to you for only a couple bucks for your pain. Now you're not allowed to do that because you done criminalized all the doctors for trying to alleviate, you know, people's pains. And um, since they couldn't get their Oxycontin, they went out on the streets and they got themselves some cheap heroin. So all we're doing is just uh, smashing one problem and then it's creating another one. It's almost like, you know, it's like we have um, a, a, a mouse on the island, so then we release a cat. 
and or we have a bunch of rats on the island, and then we have a bunch of cats to kill all the rats, and now we got all these cats everywhere, and then we put dogs on it, and now we got all these dogs, and so we just keep on making the problem worse and worse, and the war on drugs has never succeeded, it has never helped anybody, and um, I'll just make this last point. Uh, if my neighbor is a heroin addict, okay, so I see what's going on, you know, they've been doing meth, and then they're in the Oxycontin, now they're a bunch of heroin addicts, I've been calling the police on them, right, this is, this is, I'm taking the perspective of some sort of, you know, Republican GOP snitch, right, oh my god, I'm so terrorized, all these damn kids with their damned internet and their damn smartphones, and, um, and so you've called the police on them several times. They've been in and out of jail. You've ruined their life. They can't get a good job, but somehow they just keep on surviving and they get right back out of jail. And then sometimes you see more car, you know, uh, activity going on over there and you're got like, damn, we didn't fix this problem. It's still going on. Well, they're a felon. How are they going to make any money? They're going to go right back to the same situation that they was in until you start to give a shit. And that's what we need to deal with um, with addiction. We shouldn't be criminalizing addiction. It should be love and compassion. And even the two things, the Good Samaritan and the needle exchange people are criticizing. It's, uh, it's like, what planet do you live on? You got a heroin addict and you think that they're going to go to the, go the, to the cops and ask them for needles? You think that's uh, enabling somebody? What planet do you live on? <laughs> Um, I'm glad that they have the Good Samaritan and the Needle Exchanges because it shows that there are some legislators who are pushing this uh, war on drugs in the right direction. It's a public health issue. We cannot criminalize addiction. We got to start caring about one another, and that's what it's going to take. Instead of calling the cops on your neighbors who's addicted to heroin, why don't you go over there and say, Hey, man, what the fuck? What is up? What is up? What do you need? What do you want me to do? I don't, you know, I don't like you bringing this in here in the, you know, this criminal activity. What, what can I do to help? Because they're sick. There's something wrong with them. So show some love and some kindness instead of getting them busted up over the head every so many years. <coughs> Just because you're an asshole. It doesn't fix the problem. You can't get rid of the drugs. You've, you know, you've had this. It's been um, 1971. We still have moonshiners. Even though 50 out of 120 counties in Kentucky is dry, there's, you know, you can't, you can't fuck with the hill, people. But we have moonshiners. It's number one cash crop is marijuana out there. The, the, the war on drugs, we create the Al Capones. We create very wealthy drug dealers. Now that heroin has been, you know, you'll be a class D felony if you only have two grams. So if you're pushing heroin, you know how much money you're getting? My God, I bet heroin is going so fast. The heroin dealers, as soon as they get the stuff, is just going through, the, and then it's risk reward. So the higher the risk, the higher the reward. So they can charge more money. Drug dealers have more money in their pockets now, and so do the prosecutors, and the judges, and the cops, and the white collar mafia. That's all we've done is enrich the white collar mafia. We've just given more money to the people who's going to go around hitting and busting people over the heads. They're not going to solve the problems. And then we made more money for the drug dealers. You want to get uh, less money out of corrupt government officials' hands? You want less money in drug dealers' hands? Legalize it. Do it like Portugal. Show some love. Show some compassion. My God. Well, you know, Southern hospitality. That's supposed to be our thing, right? Southern hospitality, giving a shit about one another. Uh, the, the world isn't divided between Republicans and Democrats. The world is divided between those who give a shit, those who care, versus those who don't care at all. And unfortunately, it seems like those who care are the ones who have something to say but can't say it. And then those who don't give a shit have nothing to say whatsoever and they can't stop talking. Jonathan Masters, Hudson, Kentucky, March 28th, 2015, Kentucky. Go Green 2015.